The mysterious beauty of the Northern Lights has dazzled us since the first civilizations, with the Norse people believing them to be the reflections of the Valkyrie's armor as they led warriors to Odin, and the Cree Indians believed them to be the spirits of their dead friends and relatives trying to communicate with those they'd left behind. However, they were first named formally by Galileo Galilei as the Aurora Borealis in 1619, which in Latin means Dawn of the North with its counterpart the Southern Lights named the Aurora Australis, as almost a mirror image of the Northern Lights. But it wasn't until 1896, when Norwegian scientist Christian Birkeland studied the Aurora, did we come to our first conclusion about its cause. And more recent discoveries about magnetic reconnection have brought us once again closer to truly understanding the Northern Lights. In order to answer the question of where the Aurora comes from, we must start our journey at the Sun. The Sun is effectively a huge nuclear fusion reactor, where hydrogen atoms combine under extreme gravitational pressure and a temperature of over 15 million degrees Kelvin, which allows the hydrogen atoms to overcome strong electromagnetic forces and fuse together in a proton-proton chain reaction that, at the scale of our Sun, releases an enormous amount of thermal and kinetic energy. As a result of this intense heat, our sun is essentially a gigantic sphere of superheated plasma. Plasma is the fourth conventional state of matter, and is for the most part ionized gas. Plasma makes up 99.999% of the observable universe, so everyone should know that matter becomes plasma when the relative kinetic energy of its atoms is so great that the electrons and their nuclei are able to overcome the Coulomb force and move freely. The Sun constantly hurls plasma out into space, at speeds varying from 180 to 500 miles per second, fast enough to escape the Sun's gravitational pull. This is called the solar wind. Its two main sources are coronal holes and helmet streamers near the Sun's equator, or streamer belt. However, for the aurora to truly occur, a coronal mass ejection, aka a solar storm is needed. Coronal mass ejections, or CMEs, consist of a huge amount of plasma, travelling at a much higher velocity, coming from an extremely hot layer of the sun, called the corona, which can reach staggering temperatures of 1 million degrees Kelvin, compared to the surface's mega 6000. These CMEs are often associated with solar flares or solar prominence eruptions, but CMEs can still occur independently of these events. So how are these CMEs released? Well, as the sun rotates and its plasma convex, the field lines twist and tangle into a contorted group, and as pressure from the electrical field forces opposing magnetic field lines together, a phenomenon called magnetic reconnection occurs, which is key to both the release of CMEs from the sun as well as the formation of the aurora itself. A crucial attribute of a CME is the fact that it contains a magnetic cloud, which is the embedded magnetic field of the sun. This is necessary for the formation of the aurora. Magnetic reconnection is the phenomenon which occurs when the topology of a magnetic field is changed as magnetic field lines of opposing direction meet. This causes the release of kinetic and thermal energy. The change in topology causes the directions of the field lines to change or break analogous to a rubber band snapping with the release of energy changing the directions by which the particles are accelerated in. The Earth is constantly being bombarded by solar wind, and without a key feature of the Earth, life would not be possible, as solar wind is not as friendly as it might sound. Fortunately, the Earth's core contains molten iron, that, when it roils around, generates a magnetic field that shields the Earth from any such streams of charged particles. Most of the time, these particles are stored in radiation belts surrounding the Earth in either the inner or outer Van Allen radiation belts. Previously, it was believed that particles from the CME simply streamed into weak points at the poles about the magnetic field lines, creating the aurora. However, this would have caused a disc-shaped aurora over the poles, rather than the oval-shaped one we see. Instead, from the data collected by the NASA project Themis to figure out what triggered the northern lights, we saw, using thermal imaging, that during auroral substorms, events in which the aurora's condition and state changes, that there were spikes in thermal energy at the points where plasma collides with the magnetosphere, which, correlating to a shift in the auroral substorm, 
provides significant evidence for magnetic reconnection as the cause of the aurora. As a CME approaches Earth, it will first encounter the bow shock, where its particles will go subsonic before colliding with the magnetosphere itself, and given its magnetic field opposing that of the Earth's magnetosphere, magnetic reconnection will occur, which causes the magnetic field lines of the Earth to snap like a rubber band, and the new field lines formed to lead plasma down to the day side of the poles. This is the daytime aurora, however the light of the sun prevents us from viewing it, we are interested in the nighttime aurora. The field lines just mentioned snap back to the magnetotail and form closed field lines once again. In turn, this exerts more pressure on the magnetotail, which closes inwards. Then the opposing magnetic field lines of the magnetotail reconnect, accelerating ionized particles from the Van Allen belts and from the trapped CME particles along the field lines into both poles, creating the nighttime aurora that we have modeled at for centuries. Note that there is always some aurora present in our sky, as a few particles are able to infiltrate the magnetosphere and collide with our ionosphere, but this is not a true aurora in effect. The aurora appears in an oval shape around both poles, and is called the auroral oval, and the auroral zone is the area in which it occurs. As the Earth's magnetic field originates from the centre of the Earth, there are ring-like holes at the poles, and it is on the boundary of these where the aurora appears. As for the colours of the aurora, when the charged particles enter the Earth's ionosphere, they collide with different gases to give off the incredible colours we can see. The different colours depend on which gases they collide with, and the emission spectra of those gases. There are three main molecules responsible for the aurora's colours, and they are monatomic oxygen, diatomic nitrogen, and ionized diatomic nitrogen. It all depends on the altitude. At heights above 250 kilometers, the ionosphere is very thin, and hence few particles collide, but when they do, they tend to collide with oxygen, which is the most abundant gas beyond the 250 kilometer mark, as it has a relatively low density. The oxygen at this altitude is monatomic because of the harsh UV radiation from the sun, breaking the usual diatomic bonds, and it emits a brick-red glow. However, this brick-red glow is usually faint and outshone by the other colours. Next, from 100 km to 250 km up, green is the prominent colour, as a result of the collisions with N2 molecules, which ionise the nitrogen, and this gives off a blue colour, whereas the electron given off during ionisation collides with the monatomic oxygen. It gives off a lime green colour. The blend of the blue and the lime green gives off the prevailing green. Finally, from 80 km to 100 km up, pink is the most prominent colour, as positively charged N2 and regular N2 emit purple and deep red respectively, and these combine to form pink. Lastly, I should mention the four main shapes of aurora, discrete, diffuse, pulsating and corona, which unfortunately we do not have time to look at. And that brings the story of where the northern lights come from to an end. Goodbye.